The Other Side of Modernism. James Burnham and His Legacy. Excerpt from Beautiful Losers, Essays on the Failure of American Conservatism. By Samuel T. Francis. Narrated by Skeptical Waves. James Burnham died of cancer at his home in Kent, Connecticut, on July 28, 1987, at the age of 81. Debilitated since 1978 by a stroke that impaired the functioning of his memory, he had long since ceased to write the fortnightly column The Protracted Conflict in National Review, on the masthead of which his name had appeared since its first issue in 1955 A Reticent Man by Nature, Burnham by the time of his death was not well known in either the national intellectual community or even in the conservative movement with which he had worked since the 1950s, and many today who are pleased to call themselves conservatives confess their ignorance of who he was or what he had done. Although Burnham from the 1930s to the 1950s was a highly visible star in the New York intellectual constellation and continued his luminescence among New York conservatives until his stroke, his death elicited barely a twinkle from either the right or the left save among friends and former colleagues. The indifference is all the more striking since President Reagan had seen fit to award Burnham the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1983 and issued a laudatory tribute to him after his death. The neglect of Burnham by liberal and even mainstream media is explained by many conservatives as the response to be expected from those whose incantations to the broad mind and the open mouth are belied by their contempt for those who dissent from their canons. Yet Burnham was also neglected by many conservatives, who knew him best through his column and his classic Suicide of the West, repeatedly reprinted since its first publication in 1964. George H. Nash in his monumental The Conservative Intellectual Movement in America since 1945 acknowledges Burnham's importance in the emergence of conservative anti-communism in the 1940s and 1950s, but neither Mr. Nash nor most other students of American conservatism have fully appreciated the significance of Burnham's political ideas or their potential for constructing a serious and critical political theory for the contemporary American right. Burnham did not generally socialize with the conservative movement. He was not a member of the Philadelphia or Mont Pelerin societies, rarely contributed to conservative periodicals other than National Review, and seldom or never participated in the seminars and summer schools of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute or Young Americans for Freedom. His aloofness was probably in part a personal choice, but it also reflected an incongruity between his mind and that of the mainstream of American conservatism as it has developed since the 1940s. Burnham and his more percipient readers were aware of the incongruity which served to keep him at a distance from many of his professional collaborators on the right, while, ironically, causing the left to concentrate its fire on his writings to a greater degree than on those of any other conservative intellectual figure of our era. Until fairly recently, the mainstream of American conservative thought could be divided into two camps, generally called libertarian and traditionalist. The former centered on individual rights and the limitations of the state and emphasized the free market as a means of solving social and economic problems. The traditionalist wing of conservatism focused on the duties of men in a historic continuum and emphasized authority, order, and religious and ethical virtue. Although subsidiary and eclectic bodies of opinion flourished, and though some like the late Frank S. Meyer sought to formulate a fusionist school that bridged the contradictions between libertarians and traditionalists, these were the generally predominant currents among American conservatives until the 1970s. At that time, with the rise of the new right and neoconservatism, which are less schools of political thought than political and policy movements, the clear dual framework of conservative thought began to break up. James Burnham belonged to neither the libertarian nor the traditionalist category, though his thought was not merely a bridge between them. He often endorsed governmental action in the economy and was strongly criticized by libertarians such as Murray Rothbard and Edith Efron for his fundamental ideas of man and society. Yet while these ideas emphasized order, authority, and power, they were rather clearly distinct from those expressed by orthodox traditionalists. The religious and ethical orientation of traditionalism has led it to look to pre-modern thought, classical and medieval, for its ideas on social and political order. Indeed, traditionalist conservatives generally identify themselves in opposition to what they call modernity and its legacy. As traditionalist Stephen J. Tonser defined the concept in a noted address to the Philadelphia Society, later reprinted in National Review, in 1986. By modernity mean that revolutionary movement and culture which derived from a belief in man's radical alienation, in God's unknowability or non-existence, and in man's capacity to transform or remake the conditions of his existence. The thoroughgoing secularism, the attack upon the past, religious and social, aristocratic or bourgeois, the utopian dream of alienation overcome and innocence restored are all linked together in the modernist sensibility. The romantic satanic hero is the same man as the Prometheus of Shelley and Marx, the Zarathustra of Nietzsche. 
modernism in the view of Dr. Tonser and other adherents of traditionalist thought, most notably, Eric Fogelin, Russell Kirk, Richard Weaver, and Leo Strauss, among others, cuts men off from the transcendent. Hence, modernism denies or ignores God and concentrates on secular knowledge and action. Human knowledge can be only empirical, moral statements can be only relative or factual, there being a dichotomy between fact and value, and human action cannot be modeled on transcendent or spiritual goods that either do not exist or cannot be known. Hence, science, the immoral and empirical description of nature, is the characteristically modern way of knowing, and technology, the application of science to practice, is the typically modern way of doing. While traditionalists bring philosophical and religious arguments against modernism, their major practical argument against it is its political implications. Denying the absolute and transcendent sources of moral values, modernism has no grounds for resisting tyranny or controlling anarchy. In Dr. Tonser's view, we can see that the denial of the existence of order as the ground of being, and the rejection of the transcendent, are a one-way street to Dachau. If everything is permitted and the will to power is the only reality, then the gulag is as logical as an Euler diagram. Modern political thought from the time of Machiavelli and modern liberalism from the time of Mill have rejected the idea of an absolute moral order to which social and political institutions should conform and in the absence of a basis for firm moral judgments are unable to distinguish between dissent and subversion, friend and enemy, right and wrong, or to exercise power in the interests of justice, and a morally based social order. What is striking about the political thought of James Burnham, however, is that it is distinctively modernist. This was true not only of his post-Marxist period in the early 1940s, when he published The Managerial Revolution and the Machiavellians, but also of his final period from the mid-1950s onward, when he was identifiably conservative. In The Machiavellians, which remained the fundamental statement of his general theoretical political framework, he explored the school of political thought extending from Machiavelli to his positivist heirs of the 19th and 20th centuries, Vilfredo Pareto, Gaetano Mosca, Roberto Michels, and Georges Sorel. The conclusion of the book was that there exists a science of power that can describe the general laws of human political behavior based on inferences from historical experience. The recurring pattern of change expresses the more or less permanent core of human nature as it functions politically. The instability of all governments and political forms follows in part from the limitless human appetite for power. Burnham's emphasis on the limitless human appetite for power places him in the camp of moderns such as Nietzsche and Alfred Adler, and of later sociobiologists who write of the imperial animal and instincts of dominance, and of other exponents of an essentially irrationalist depiction of human nature such as Dostoevsky, Conrad, Freud, and Pareto himself. The science of power that discovers and explores this human appetite is itself a product of empirical observation. It was through such observation, either of the historical past or of contemporaries, that Machiavelli and his heirs constructed this science, and, unlike the medieval Dante, with whom Burnham contrasts Machiavelli, they did so by eschewing the formal for the real. By real meaning, wrote Burnham, I refer to the meaning not in terms of the fictional world of religion, metaphysics, miracles, and pseudo-history, but in terms of the actual world of space, time, and events. The predominant elements of Burnham's thought separate him from the ethical absolutes around which pre-modern and contemporary traditionalist ideas center. Whereas the latter sought to constrain power and the human appetites by ethical precepts and religious institutions, Burnham was specific in rejecting this effort. The Machiavellians are the only ones who have told us the full truth about power the primary object, in practice, of all rulers is to serve their own interest, to maintain their own power and privilege, no theory, no promises, no morality, no amount of goodwill, no religion will restrain power. Neither priests nor soldiers, neither labor leaders nor businessmen, neither bureaucrats nor feudal lords will differ from each other in the basic use which they will seek to make of power. Only power restrains power, when all opposition is destroyed, there is no longer any limit to what power may do. A despotism, any kind of despotism, can be benevolent only by accident. Burnham thus harbored no illusion that a particular form of society, agrarian, theocratic, or feudal, much less socialist, liberal, or democratic, could adequately restrain the appetite for power. What could restrain it was a balanced distribution of power among various social and political forces that mutually check the power of each other and in the conflict of which both political freedom and the level of civilization could flourish. Although his idea of balance derived from Machiavelli, Mosca, and Pareto, it had its roots in classical thinkers like Cicero and Polybius, but Burnham's adherence to what Ralph Darendorf would call a conflict model of society, like that of Machiavelli, Hobbes, and Marx, 
is more distinctively modern than the consensus model of most classical and medieval thinkers. Such as Aristotle, Plato, and Aquinas, as well as Burke. In the latter concept of society, men form society because they are naturally sociable, and a shared consensus, based on religious and moral beliefs and transmitted through tradition, provides a restraint on human conduct. In the conflict model, consensual elements are at best subordinate, and consensus itself is a product of conflict and eventually of domination by one social force. Thus, for Machiavelli, religion is imposed on the citizens by the legislator or prince for the purpose of internal discipline, and Marx's ideology, Pareto's derivations, Sorel's myth, and Mosca's political formula are analogous concepts. It might be argued that a book published in 1943, when Burnham was not yet 40 years old, bears only tangential relevance to his later thought. Yet there is no clear break between Burnham of the Machiavellians and his later books and articles. Indeed, the same themes, though less bluntly stated, are found in most of his later work. The last book review that Burnham published in 1978 was a highly favorable account of the autobiography of A.J. Eyre, a leading logical positivist, and in his obituaries of André Malraux and Pablo Picasso in National Review, Burnham specifically invoked Nietzsche's will to power. What defines the essence of the superman, or merely, superior man, as the German can also be translated, is his creation of his own values, thus also his rejection of, or indifference to, all values the origin and authority of which are external to himself in custom, church, tribe, or state. For Nietzsche, the supermen were not the conquerors and rulers, who were in fact often as much slaves of convention and prejudice as the servile masses, but above all the supreme poets and artists, the prophets, and the wilder of the saints. Supermen are more dangerous than H-bombs. The world can't digest very many of them, but it would be a drearier place if there weren't any. Burnham developed a similar theme of power expressed in art, and religion, in a column of 1961, where he saw Piero della Francisco's fresco of the resurrection as an allegory of the decline of the West, symbolized by the sleeping Roman centuries, and the emergence of a triumphant enemy symbolized by Christ, a Christ that has none of the physical weakness or effeminacy with which he is so often painted. Piero's risen Christ has thrown his shroud, like a cloak, over his shoulder, to reveal a spear-slashed breast that, though gaunt, is strong and hard-muscled. In his right hand he holds the standard of an unfurled white banner, quartered by a red cross, his glance, directed straight out, is majestic, terrible, almost, through the effect of those eyes that seem to stare to infinity without particular focus, obsessive. What we are looking at in Piero's picture, among so many other things, is the power and wealth and luxury of Rome gone soft and sluggish, asleep instead of alert and on guard. The closed eyes of the sentries in their handsome dress cannot see, do not even try to see, the fierce phoenix rising from the gathering ashes of their world. In both Congress and the American tradition and suicide of the West, Burnham focused on the irrational and mythic forces of tradition and ideology, and throughout his work he analyzed the basic social and political conflict between an ascendant managerial elite, using Marxist and liberal ideology as a vehicle of its power, and a declining bourgeois class expressing conservative and classical liberal ideas to resist managerial dominance. In one of the last columns he wrote prior to his stroke, he again eschewed the moralism and ideology that characterized both the left and the right. The primary goals at which I aim in this column, as in most of the books and articles I have written, are fact and analysis. I do not accept any theory of class, national, ethnic, partisan, or sectarian truth. If conclusions I reach are true, they are just as true for Russians as for Americans, for pagans as for Christians, and for blacks as for whites. Burnham, then, represents modernism in a dimension very different from that depicted by Dr. Tonser and other orthodox anti-modern traditionalists. While this school is correct in pointing to one side of modernist thought as a vehicle for revolutionary and secular millenarian ends, there is also another side to modernism, represented by Machiavelli himself, Montesquieu, Hume, and Madison, to name but a few of its early representatives. Although this body of thought is modernist in its general secularism, its reliance on empirical and historicist rather than metaphysical or rationalistic methods of inquiry, its avoidance of moral absolutism, its pessimistic and skeptical portrayal of human irrationality and the inherent appetitive forces of human nature, and its elaboration of a theory of balance rather than transcendence or moral virtue as a means of restraining human nature, it very clearly rejects the possibility of what Tonser calls man's capacity to transform or remake the conditions of his existence and the chiliasm attendant on it. Such secular transformationalism, immanentization of the eschaton, in Fogelin's phrase, is, in fact, an importation from secularized Judeo-Christian thought and, as not only Fogelin but also James Billington and the late Francis Yates have shown, 
lies at the root of modernist revolutionary totalitarianism. The other side of modernism that James Burnham represented leads not to Dachau and the Gulag but to the classical republicanism that originally informed the framers of the American Republic. Burnham's modernism alienated those traditionalist conservatives who were aware of it. Their minds tend to center on the more ethereal regions of religion, ethics, metaphysics, and aesthetics, rather than on the sociological analysis of political conflict and the geopolitics of global struggle, and they are not attracted to and are often repelled by a worldview that centers on conflict, power, and human irrationality. Whitaker Chambers, whose own mind reflected a tension between modernism and anti-modern elements and who expressed deep admiration for Burnham, nevertheless criticized him for his prudent, practical thinking. The Firebird, wrote Chambers, is glimpse living or not at all. In other words, realists have a way of missing truth, which is not invariably realistic. The Firebird refers to the classical myth of the phoenix, a bird composed of fire that, since it was consumed by flames as it flew through the air, left no body. Its existence therefore could not be proved empirically, by finding its body, it had to be seen alive or not at all. Chambers's meaning is that Burnham's worldview demanded empirical proof for things that by their nature could not be proved but were nevertheless known to be true by those who had seen, or felt or intuited, them. If both contemporary conservative traditionalists and libertarians were at odds with the contours of Burnham's thought, the left found itself attracted to it and yet at the same time repelled. Burnham's The Managerial Revolution was strongly criticized by C. Wright Mills, Ralph Darendorf, and other sociologists of the left, who saw its thesis as a direct threat to their own Marxist and neo-Marxist analyses of contemporary power relations in capitalist society. George Orwell also wrote long essays on Burnham in which he sought to deflect the criticisms that Burnham, from his perspective of modernist realism, raised against the utopian formalism of the leftist mind. Similar critiques greeted Burnham's analysis of the Cold War and communism, until, in the early 1950s, his refusal to denounce Joseph McCarthy led to his virtual expulsion from northeastern intellectual circles. Yet the left, unlike much of the right, recognized Burnham's preeminence, and in 1950 David Riesman could write in the lonely crowd of Marx, Mosca, Michels, Pareto, Weber, Veblen, or Burnham in the same sentence. The left perceived that Burnham's inversion of modernism was a far more serious threat to it than the anti-modern traditionalism that many conservatives represented, since Burnham's counter-modernism threatened to remove the philosophical grounds from under the feet of the left and leave it with no basis for its political ideology. The American right, for all its intellectual sophistication and political progress, has yet to come to terms with or make use of the implications of Burnham's thought. Libertarianism is a modernist ideology, but it does not turn modernism away from the interpretation the left has imposed on it. Neoconservatism, as Tonser argues, is also modernist, but it too refuses to challenge the conventional drift of modernism. Neoconservatives rely on an eclectic assimilation of liberal, libertarian, and traditionalist ideas, and seek only to achieve piecemeal or gradualist changes within a conventionally modernist framework. Most of the journalism and propaganda that has issued from the new right and neoconservatives cannot be taken seriously as political and social thought. Orthodox traditionalism rejects modernism, but does so in a manner that is largely alien and inexplicable to the modern mind and tends to degenerate into cultism. Among contemporary conservatives only James Burnham offered a theoretical framework and a practical application of modernist political ideas that challenge the conventional modernist categories as defined by the left. When the American right begins to understand and accept his legacy, it will begin to glimpse a more enduring victory in the protracted domestic and global conflict in which Burnham was enlisted.